together to bring our praise to God and uh, unite together in singing the hymn, All My Hope on God is Founded. Let us worship God. Let's bow now together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Almighty God, how glad we are always to gather together in the name of your Son to come before yourself, to bring to you together our praise and our worship, and once again to acknowledge that we have nothing apart from you, but with you and in you we have all things, and therefore all our hope is founded and rooted in yourself, in your Son, and in all that he has accomplished for us. We rest on that solid, secure base, living God, and seek in his strength to live out our lives for the praise of your glory. We delight in you, living God. Everything that you may know about yourself makes it clear that you are altogether worthy of our praise and our worship you display, at least in some small measure, the vast glory that is yours, a glory that it'll take us all eternity and more fully to comprehend, and we relish the prospect of simply bathing and basking through all eternity in the riches of that glory that is yours, a wise, wonderfully wise you are, living God how knowledgeable you are so that all the, the accumulation of knowledge that we manage to acquire ourselves is as absolutely nothing compared to the knowledge that is yours. And we're glad of that, glad that you know us and understand us far, far better than we know and understand ourselves. You understand all the way that we are made. You understand all the knots that there are in our lives and in our thinking. You understand all the complexity that there is, all our emotions, all our thoughts, all our attitudes, everything is known to you. And all the things that we struggle with, that we wrestle with, all the things that we try and get our head around, you know them all. We're glad in the knowledge that you, as the one who rules this world, you do so always with such immaculate wisdom. 
And we're glad, living God, for every way in which you demonstrate not only your strength and your power, but you demonstrate that the way in which you exercise that power is always with the most extraordinary precision so that you are able to, to call into being a whole universe and have everything set in its exactly right place. We praise you, living God, that there, there is nothing that you're not able to do, and we delight in that assurance because there are any number of situations that we face any number of circumstances that we have to confront and we don't have a, a clue how to handle them. We often think that they're simply going to overwhelm us, suck us down, drag us down and be the end of us. And yet for you, they're easily handled. Often living God, as we were thinking this morning, we find ourselves in the position of those disciples in the boat on the stormy seas of Galilee fearful that we are indeed going to drown, rousing your son in all our anxiety and fear and crying out to you, help us, please. And his standing there with consumate ease and simply speaking that simple word, be still, and the storm dies down. That astonishing control over all of nature, no matter what the weather men and women may say, no matter what they may predict, his ability simply to speak the word and it is done and the whole thing changes completely. We praise you, living God, that that's indeed what you are pleased to do in our lives when the whole pattern of our living has sucked us down in that vortex of sin, just dragging us down and down and we, we haven't a remedy ourselves and by your Holy Spirit you have spoken that word of life into the dark ditch of our living and raised us up again and made us new people and given to us a future in the most wonderful way, the assurance you give to us that that work that you've begun, you will complete, and that that completion of your work in the glory of heaven will indeed see us being raised from the dead, body and soul again reunited and at last made perfect so that we're able to see you and know you and love you and serve you with all our being and do so in a way that is indeed increasing in its joy and in its richness all through eternity. And we're therefore glad once again this evening, Father, on this Lord's Day, the day when we celebrate your being the resurrecting God, the day when we celebrate the fact that you have poured out your Holy Spirit upon your people, glad to gather on the evening of this day to rejoice in yourself and in all that you are and in all that you've done and to ascribe to you the praise and the honor and the glory for all that we have, for all that we know, for all that we will yet enjoy in our lives through eternity. Bless you, living God, grant that we may know the help of your Holy Spirit, that we may recognize your own presence amongst us. We might know his moving in our hearts to stir and kindle within us a sense of wonder, a sense of delight, a sense of joy in the person of your Son that there may indeed flow from our hearts through your Holy Spirit, that, that great torrent of praise and adoration that will ascend to your throne and bring you glory again tonight. Meet with us, Father, please, we pray, as we ask it all through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. When we turn to the Word of God, Katie's going to come and read the passage for us from Isaiah. So if you have a Bible to hand, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, we'll put the words on the screen as always. Good evening. Our reading this evening is Isaiah chapter 9, reading from verses 1 to 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder.
For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Amen. It's, thank you, Katie. We'll come back to that passage in just a moment. And uh, we're going to be looking in particular at verse 6 this evening. I had thought we might do verses 6 and 7, but I think we'll, we'll end up just with verse 6 this evening and maybe come back to it, God willing, next Sunday evening for verse 7. But before we turn back to that passage, you might like just to keep it open. We're going to sing again to God's praise the song, You're the Word of God the Father. We turn to this passage. We are always keen to encourage uh, you as families, if you're watching as a family, to have children share in our evening worship. If you're not able to be here in person, then uh, uh, there is a resource that uh, ties in with the passage that we look at. And uh, there's uh, a resource tonight, a worksheet for children that uh, touches on the passage that we're going to look at this evening. Um, doesn't matter what age you are, you may find that of help as well. Covers always the same ground as the, uh, the message. Let's uh, pray that God would indeed illumine our minds. God, our Father, uh, your word is, is so, so rich in the truth that it conveys, in the beauty and the glory to which it points us in the person of your Son always, that 
We, we need the help of your Holy Spirit to be able to comprehend, to, to be able to grasp and to embrace and to, to have imprinted on our hearts and ingrained into the very fiber of our being the splendor and the glory of that truth. And so we ask, please, that we may know that ministry of your Holy Spirit who delights more than anything to exalt Jesus, to commend him to us, to portray him in all the fullness of his grace and glory. And therefore, it's with a confidence that we ask in Jesus' name, please, Holy Spirit of God, do that among us this evening. And we'll gladly give you the praise and the glory for it as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. These uh, opening verses in chapter 9 of Isaiah, um, a wonderful passage and uh, very memorable. We're all familiar with them. And uh, they are rich in, indeed in that truth of God. Uh, they, they speak about the way in which uh, a gloom and a distress that has been our experience, a kind of deep darkness that weighs down upon us, is uh, remarkably lifted from us and exchanged for a great joy, a great bright light shining in upon our experience. And it, it often is for us just the, the tonic that we need because there are so many factors in our lives, so many factors in our world that do just crowd in like a great uh, looming cloud of darkness upon our lives and weigh down upon us and, and often leave us, particularly at this time of year when it's really dark and it's really cold and just about everything that you can think of breaks down and they break down at the same time and no one's there to fix it and, and it's just life becomes one perpetual round of problem after difficulty after hassle and, uh, and a gloom can settle on us. Uh, we don't have Christmas to look forward to. It's about 360 days until the next Christmas. And, and, and just it is, um, just the prospect of more darkness, more, more coldness, uh, more this, that, and the next thing. Uh, and a gloom can settle on us quite easily. And uh, often we need just the encouragement of the, the Word of God to, to lift our spirits. And I hope that uh, uh, God's Word uh, this evening does just that and, and enables us to lift our, our eyes off uh, all the things that surround us and that do uh, create that sort of gloom, create that sort of despair, create that, uh, that darkness in our experience, lift our eyes off that and up to the Lord himself to see him for who he is. And uh, we saw last Sunday evening in the opening part of the, the chapter, verses uh, 1 to 5, the way in which um, that joy that is spoken of, and you, you see that um, you have increased our joy and we rejoice as, uh, as those who are harvesting, we rejoice as those warriors who won a victory. That joy is described for us in terms of the experience of it. It is the joy of, of knowing growth and enlargement, and it's the joy of knowing victory in the place of defeat, and it's the joy of knowing order in place of the chaos of our lives. And, uh, and there is a real joy in that, um, in the, the prospect of that and the enjoyment of that. Um, it is a joy. We, we long for that growth. We long for that victory. We long for that order in our lives. And, and sometimes we, we're inclined to think, well, you know, you just don't know me. You don't know my circumstances at all because I'm not experiencing growth at all. I live in a land where it seems that the whole cause of Jesus Christ is going down the tubes. The church is in decline. People are not interested. People stay away. They're uh, and, uh, antipathetic towards the, the Christian church and so on. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of growth happening here. It doesn't seem like I'm getting a lot of victory in my life because I seem to have one hassle after another, one problem after another. It doesn't seem to be getting any better like that. And instead of there being an order about my life, it seemed often that my life is falling to bits. And um, we, we often can, can approach it like it just didn't look like that joy is going to be our experience. And, and I want to stir that joy in your hearts because that's the desire of the Lord Jesus himself, that there should be that joy that this chapter speaks about, that joy in our hearts as well. It's a little bit like the experience of Gideon. Um, Brian will be speaking about Gideon on Wednesday at our relaunch. 
Um, but, but Gideon, the Lord, comes to him at a time when, when it is just gloom in the land of Israel. There is distress, there is defeat, they, they don't have an answer, they're, they're diminishing, they're shrinking rather than expanding, they're suffering defeat rather than anything, and, and life in Israel is chaotic, and God comes and says, uh, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon's response is, it doesn't look like it. Just didn't look as though the Lord is with us because it looks like God has abandoned us. It looks like God is not doing anything at all. And by the way, I'm not a mighty warrior at all. You've got the wrong guy entirely. And, and the Lord really has to re-educate him and, and enable him to, to recognize that whatever may confront him in the circumstances of his life, there is a greater reality. And that reality is bound up with the fact that the Lord has come to be with him. And therefore, for ourselves as well, um, you have to read on to, to verse 6 in order to understand why that joy of growth, why that joy of victory, why that joy of order is indeed our experience and will be our experience. Why we may expect that, why we may look for that, why we may pray for that, why may we, we may uh, anticipate that in our lives and in our living. Verse 6, why? Because, because this is the reason God's remedy for, God's answer to all the gloom, all the despair, all the defeat, all the darkness, God's answer is a person. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given. And, and always the, the scriptures are pointing us to this person. Not just at Christmas time, but all the time. This is what we have been given. And, and you'll see the way in which verse 6 starts there very deliberately. And in a sense, um, in a way that leaves you, you scratching your head. Um, to, to us, a child is born. That's uh, the Hebrew word is, is a male child is born. And, and then you go on and, and a son. And you think, well, a, a male child being born... That is a son, clearly. Um, but th there is a, a clear distinction being made between these two statements about this person. The first of which underlines his very real humanity. This child is indeed one who is born. He doesn't just kind of land uh, in, in some astonishing fashion out of the blue, out of heaven itself, and, and uh, God himself landing here, but is born as one of us, his very real humanity. And then a son, and not just any son, but the son is given to us, his deity. This is the very son of God, the one who is born among us, who is that truly human individual, is also the very son of God and given and given to us. Um, that's the, the way in which the, the angel spoke to the shepherds. Remember, when the message was first publicly announced, the very first public announcement of the birth of Jesus is to shepherds out of the field, to the ordinary punters, as it were, rather than just to the kind of high hygienes, the religious specialists, or anything like that, but to the ordinary individuals, uh, to you is given a savior. To you has been born a savior. And, uh, and it's that note that is being struck to you. This is for you. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how, how far wrong you've gone. It doesn't matter that you have nothing really to contribute. It doesn't matter that you've made a mess of things. To you is given. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And uh, then there is this fourfold designation of them, these four names that are given to describe this person, that we might understand why it is that we are able to rejoice. Uh, having this child, then that joy is yours. Having this child, there is that growth. Having this child, there is that victory. Having this child, there is that order. That's what he comes to do. Remember, as I was saying last Sunday evening, that uh, those three, three great statements, those three great pictures to describe our experience are matching very deliberately and very carefully the opening statement of the book of Genesis, the whole beginning of the Bible. God, the great creator, this is what he does. Uh, he brings that order into our chaos. He brings that growth into our emptiness, and he brings that 
victory into our place of defeat. Light shines into the darkness. The darkness hasn't overcome it. Um, it is matching in our experience what God, the great creator, always does. This is what God does. And um, that joy is, is found in this person, Jesus. That's why the Bible is just insistent, adamant, consistent, the whole way through pointing us to this Jesus, saying, it's him that you need. It's him that has been given. It's in him that you find that life and in him that you find that joy. Um, some of us take an awful lot of persuading to believe that somehow it could be as simple as that. Sometimes we're inclined to think, surely there must be something that I need to do. Surely there must be something that means I can, I can earn God's favor. I can earn this growth. I can earn this victory. Uh, and it's as simple as this. You, you take this child, Jesus. You take him. And you have him. And then you have that joy. You have and you experience that growth. You experience that victory. You experience that order. Uh, and when you ask, well, well why? And, and how come? This is the answer you get in verse 6. You need to understand who he is. And you have then these four great um, <clears throat> resounding designations that are given to him. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Um, no wonder it is set to music. Uh, no wonder you, you automatically have to, to kind of think in terms of Handel's Messiah. Uh, you want to just get the whole orchestra uh, combining together to, to sound out these great, glorious, resonant truths that are so, so basic. Uh, and it takes all four of these designations to begin to describe just who this Jesus is and just why this child that is born, this son that is given, is indeed the one through whom that joy is known whereby growth, uh, victory, and order become our experience in our lives. We are inclined, I think, to, to kind of look at them, these names, and simply conclude, uh, wonderful counselor, yeah, he's kind of wise, that's good, uh, mighty God, he's strong, everlasting father, he's kind, and prince of peace, he's, he's good, um, and move on. Uh, and we miss so, so much. These are, are simply four great descriptive um, corner points, as it were, like, like uh, a, a square built around this Jesus to, to enable us to see him from four different perspectives, to see who he is. And uh, I find it um, fascinating. Uh, I, I can't prove this to you, and I've, I've not actually come across anyone else who, who will argue the case like this. But, but I, I find it fascinating that in the New Testament, the New Testament starts off precisely like this, with what? With four designations, four descriptions of Jesus. You need all four Gospels. Uh, and, I, and I hope to, to show you, um, I would suggest to you that uh, the four great designations of Jesus here, the four great names that are given to him, are matched by and paralleled by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in, in a very precise way. It's as if um, this statement here is then expanded out in the New Testament in its opening notes, its opening four uh, sounds are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here are the four descriptions, and now they are, they are unraveled, and, and uh, something of the, the richness, something of the fullness of what is meant by wonderful counsel, a mighty God, everlasting Father, a Prince of Peace, are, are then paraded out for us so that we might begin to see it on the big screen. Screen. We might see it in the, uh, the, the kind of three-dimensional moving scene of, uh, of cinematography as we are given this, this huge picture of who this Jesus is. He is wonderful. He is the source of all joy, the source of all life. He is the author of all creation, the Lord of all people. He is altogether uh, to, to delight in. He is wonderful in the extreme, and it takes four Gospels to describe him. Wonderful counselor, first of all. Um, and, and I hope that you will, you will see this. Now, I, I hope you see that I'm not just um, uh, uh, concocting something. I, I do think that there is a, a very precise paralleling 
in the, the, the very structure of the scriptures that, that really takes this, which is so basic. We understand that as the, the essence of, uh, of the gospel in the Old Testament, the great promise of God that's what's read every Christmas time and expand it out so that we might begin to see it in its fullness. What is Matthew's gospel? What is the distinctive of Matthew's gospel? You will think, you, you'll probably say, well, it's, you know, it's kind of written to Jews and it's written with that uh, uh, Jewish constituency in the background, but that's true. And, and one of the things that is a distinctive feature of Matthew's gospel, um, there are a number of distinctives. One is, is the, um, the way in which it is, it, it is mirroring the, the book of Deuteronomy, it is, uh, the, the, uh, the Pentateuch, the five books of the, the Torah. Uh, there are the five blocks of teaching material in Matthew's gospel. Very deliberately, uh, Jesus is the one who, who is himself the Torah, who is himself the law, who is himself the truth of God, the wisdom of God. And, uh, and not the least part of what Matthew is doing is time after time after time in a way that is unique to him, he is drawing the lines of connection between what you see in Jesus and the, the statements of the scriptures in the Old Testament. And you'll say, well, that's because, you know, Matthew's a Jew and he's writing to Jews and, and he wants just to familiarize them with the, the, uh, the, the Jewish scriptures. But, but his point is, um, Jesus is not an accident. Jesus is something that had been planned by God from way, way back in the beginning. And this God is a God who has plans a God who does not act randomly, a God who has plans and whose plans are good and whose plans are true and whose plans reach back into all eternity and reach forward through all eternity as well. He is the wonderful counselor in that manner. Remember how Jeremiah, when he writes to the exiles in, uh, in Babylon, in Jeremiah chapter 29 at verse 11, he, he brings the message of God, I know the plans that I have for you says the Lord. Plans to do you good and not harm. Plans to give you hope and a future. Those are the plans of God for this beleaguered people, this people who have gone astray, this people who have been disobedient, these people who have gone off the rails and who must have thought we have totally blown it. There cannot be a future for us. We have, we have really messed up big time and God comes to them and says, listen, I have plans for you. And, and this does not surprise me and, and what has happened to you and your disobedience and your performance does not affect my plans for you. My plans for you are good plans. They always have been, they always will be, they will find their fulfillment and those plans are to do you good, not harm, and to give you hope and to give you a future. And sometimes we, we are inclined to think that, that actually we have better plans than the Lord. And, and that is the height of nonsense. Your plans are never, ever, ever going to be even remotely as good or as wonderful or as wise as the plans of this God who plans from the beginning and who has purposed from the beginning. That's what Paul is on about at the start of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter one, this God who has predestined us. And we get all kind of hung up about this whole notion of predestination. It means that God has planned your destiny. God has planned a good future for you. That's what he's planned because he is good. He has planned the most amazing, wonderful, glorious way of bringing you to something that is so beyond your wildest dreams and its glory, splendor, and beauty in life. You couldn't even begin to countenance that could be possible. God has planned that from the beginning. Why? Because he is the wonderful counselor. It's interesting here, the, uh, the terminology that is used by Isaiah is, is almost the opposite of what we, we find in the English translations. We read wonderful and think it's an adjective because wonderful is an adjective. It's not an adjective in the original, it's a noun. It is a noun that describes something that can only really be explained on the basis of a God who does the extraordinary thing. Something that can only be explained by the intervention of the living God. Something that is way beyond anything that we ourselves could accomplish. Uh, it is a noun. It is a wonder. And counselor is not a noun in the Hebrew. It's a verb. In other words, it's not a title. You know, what do you do? Well, I'm a counselor. It's not, it's not a position. It's not a role. It's not an occupation. 
It is what he does. It is a verb. It is a doing word. He, he counsels. He, he has the ability to, to see what needs to be done and to plan and to advise and to guide and to direct and to ensure that that which has been planned does indeed attain its uh, fulfillment. Uh, and all the way through, we are being reminded of that um, the end of chapter 11 of Romans. Remember Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul is, is really uh, working through on the, the huge canvas of all of history, God's dealings with humanity from way back in the very beginning in the fall of, of humanity and Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, all the way through the promise that God has made to Abram and these dealings with Abram and the, pe the people that, that flowed from Abram, the Jewish people, all God's dealings with them and the way in which uh, he has then expanded that out to the Gentiles. And as he rounds off the, the extraordinary plan of God that is being worked out in history and will find its consummation further down the line in history, he rounds off, oh, the depth, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Uh, quoting uh, Isaiah. Remember the passage in Isaiah 40, who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counsel? We, we often, we want to instruct the Lord. And, and the scriptures say, how, how daft can you get? You want to instruct the Lord? I mean, who are you to start instructing the Lord? Who are you to, to come to the Lord and say, listen, I, I kind of think you've got it wrong here. This is not really the way that things should be working out. This is not really the way you should be dealing with this situation that I'm, uh, I'm uh, having to handle in a minute. I, I think it should be handled in this way. Who on earth are you to instruct the Lord? Uh, and Isaiah then goes on in chapter 42 to speak about the way in which God has spread out the whole universe. And uh, there is that great passage, obviously, in, in Job. Um, Job was a wise man. Um, there's no doubt about that. The greatest man in the East and uh, a very prosperous man. He managed his affairs really well. He was, he was a clever guy, an intelligent guy, and a very wise man and a very godly man as well. And, and he'd have to be because for 37 chapters, he, he has to argue the case against a whole barrage from some pretty, pretty articulate, theologically minded individuals who have it in for him. And he is pretty wise in the way that he's able to answer them persistently, consistently like that. And 37 chapters later, God steps in. And God then starts asking some questions. And it's, it's a, a barrage of questions. Chapter 38. The Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. And he said, who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set? On, or who laid its corners? And while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment? When I fixed limits for it? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? Have you journeyed to the springs of the deep or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanse of it? And he goes on like that, one question after another, barrage of questions saying, come on, Job, tell me, are you able to do all of that? Were you there when it, it, the universe was born into being? Do you know how to do that? Do you know how to speak a word in it and, and bring it into being? Do you know how to hold it all in being? Do you know how to go into the, the depths of the earth? Do you know how to go into the depths of, of death itself? Do you know how to handle all of these things? And after two chapters of that, Job kind of puts his hand up and says, okay, yeah, I, I get it, you know. Um, and the Lord says, hang on, I haven't finished yet. And then there's another two chapters where the Lord comes in again and, and just runs the whole gamut of, of uh, creation past Job until Job is constrained to say, listen, I know nothing. I may be, I may be uh, a pretty intelligent guy and I may be pretty wise in terms of human uh, learning and I may have a few initials after my name and a few degrees and so on, but but I know nothing before yourself. You know everything, Lord. You are wise in a way that's way, way beyond me. And that's Jesus. Wise. Wonderful counselor. In the way that he counsels his people. In such a manner that we're constrained to say that that can only be of God. 
his ability to put his finger on precisely the issue in our life. Remember the, the, the woman at the well in Samaria, John chapter 4, and she wants to chat about a whole load of different things, and he just puts his finger on the, the nub of the matter with her. And, and she just goes back to Samaria and says, listen, you've got you've to come and see this guy who told me everything about myself. He just knows me. That, that astonishing wisdom that is his. Um, we could be here all night on that. Um, that's how wise he is. Uh, and he has plans for your life. And he's not panicked by the things that overtake you. He's not panicked by COVID. He's not panicked by, by suffering. He's not panicked by this, that, or the next thing. In your life, he, he knows exactly what he's doing with your life. You can, you can safely entrust him to you. He knows how to handle all the difficulties that come our way. He is the wonderful counselor. Matthew's gospel highlights that. When you get to Mark, you begin to recognize, yeah, he's, he's not just wise, he's, he is mighty. He is the mighty God. Mark is the shortest of the four gospels, as you, uh, I'm sure, are, are aware of. And it is, basically, it is just all action. This is a God who does things and who, got, who does some pretty dramatic things and pretty astonishing things and pretty uh, remarkable things. He does mighty things. He is the mighty God. There is nothing that this God cannot do. And, and really from the, the get-go, it is just all action. It is boom, 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 boom. Immediately, Jesus is doing this. There is not a situation he's not able to handle. And so within the space of the first chapter, he has called four fishermen, four ordinary fishermen, and he has summoned them away from their boats. He has simply spoken a word, and they've dropped everything, and they start following him. He has, he has healed uh, the mother-in-law of Simon. He has healed a man with leprosy. And before you know it, he is healing multitudes of people. He is touching this person, that person, reaching out. People are being healed. People's lives are being changed. There are mighty deeds going on that mean people are, are scratching their heads and wondering what on earth is going on? How on earth is this happening? Who on earth is this that is doing these mighty deeds like that? And, uh, and then you find as he goes on, there is this catalog, this man who is lowered through the, the ceiling there um, uh, by his friends and all the crowd around Jesus. And he simply speaks the word, says, your, son, your sins are forgiven. And they say, come on, uh, that, that's a pretty big thing. And he says, uh, um, uh, to demonstrate the truth of that, um, up on your feet and walk. And the guy gets up on his feet and he walks walks out. The guy who had to be carried in, he's up on his feet and, and moving out like that. Extraordinary things. People scratching their heads, wondering what is going on. The disciples in the boat as they cross the river, uh, cross the Sea of Galilee and the storm comes up and the winds and the waves are lashing there and they're terrified out their skin. And Jesus simply stands up in the boat and says, peace, be still. And the wind dies down, and the seas die down, and the waves die down. And they ask, who is this? Uh, I tell you who it is. It's the mighty God has stepped into that boat with them. The mighty God has stepped into this. Well, to you, a child is born. To you, a son is given. And this son is not only the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God as well. So that in the midst of your storms, whatever the storms may be, whether they're on Galilee or in Glasgow, it doesn't matter. Whatever the storms may be, he with you is able to stand there and speak that word. He can handle everything. He is the mighty God. And as he goes across from there to the, the other side of the Lake of Galilee, there is this man whom no one can handle, no one can control, this demon-possessed man, and Jesus handles him as well. And he comes back, and there's this ruler of the synagogue with his daughter who's ill, and the woman who's been suffering from this, this dreadful illness for 12 years like that, and there is healing for the woman, and there is raising from the dead for this child that is given. It is just action in the, 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 the gospel of Mark there. This Jesus is mighty to save doesn't matter what you throw in his direction. doesn't matter what the problem may be, the difficulty may be that you throw towards him. He's able to handle it. He is mighty and wonderfully able to deliver and to address the, the different needs that there are. And that's what you see, obviously, is as he confronts those different situations, things that are, are way beyond our pay grade, things that we simply cannot begin to handle. Uh, a, a young man who has died, uh, and Jesus raises him back to life again. How does that happen? Um, who on earth is this that, that is able to do these things? Mighty God. That's who this Jesus is. And you have him in your life. Then, uh, then the gloom 
disappears because for him, there's, there's not a problem that you're going to face that he's not able to handle. It may be a, it may be a dark path that he leads you down, but he knows how to, how to take you through that. He knows how to lead you through that particular valley. He knows how to handle that in a way that will be to the praise and the glory of God. It doesn't always work out the way you think it should. Remember how Martha and Mary sent to him when Lazarus, their brother, was ill, and they said, please come. And he, and he delays. He doesn't come when they think he should, and it gets worse rather than better. And Jesus says, yep, yeah, but I've deliberately delayed in order that you might see them all clearly. Just how mighty this God is, and just how able I am to help. Um, I love Psalm 71. It's a psalm of an old person. The older I get, the, the more I'm drawn to it for obvious reasons. And towards the end of that psalm, the, the psalmist is, um, is simply speaking in precisely these sorts of terms. Verse uh, 15. My mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long. Though I know not how to relate them all. I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me. And to this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. And I guess some of you who are beginning to think even when I'm old and gray, uh, you're thinking, yeah, that's kind of me now. Um, uh, yeah, you're saying, Lord, don't, don't forsake me. Uh, anoint me by your Holy Spirit. Enable me that I may declare to the next generation what a mighty God this Jesus is, what mighty things he has done. Not just way back then in history, but the mighty things that he has done in my life, in the here and now, and that he will do for you as well because Jesus is alive. He is around. He is at work, and he continues to be that God for us, the mighty God. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. That's Matthew and Mark. Everlasting Father moves us into Luke's gospel. Um, if you've been on the NASGT course, you'll appreciate that uh, uh, one of the things that, uh, that is basic to Luke's whole perspective of what God is about is bound up with Jesus being the, the son of Adam, being the true man. And in chapter 3, in that, uh, that genealogy that there is there, um, it culminates as, they, as, as he traces the genealogy of Jesus back. He traces right back, son of Adam, son of God. Um, and, and it is that, that filial relationship that uh, is being pointed to, that undergirds the whole of the gospel of Luke. Uh, that relationship that he has and that in him we now have with the living God, whereby we come to know him as Father. And um, the, the, the phraseology here is, is, is not about the first person of the Trinity, God the Father. This is Jesus how do you describe him? Um, he's described the one who is the son. A son is given to you. How do you describe him? Well, he's the everlasting father. And you think, you know, how can he be son and father? I understand that. Um, this, is, this is about the way in which he conducts himself towards his people. It's like a father. Um, I, I remember in Common Old, when our boys were pretty small on a Saturday, I'd sometimes take them up to the town center. And uh, I remember one occasion where I, I went into the uh, one shop and um, in the first shop, um, the lady recognized who I was. She obviously came from a slightly different um, ecclesiastical background. And she said, good morning, Father. And I, I could see our oldest son, he kind of looked at me and he thought, uh, do you have, a, you have a backstory that I don't know anything about that, that means she is your daughter as well? Because she looks pretty old to be your daughter if, if I'm your son. But, but she, was, she was alluding to me in a way that, that wasn't actually true in terms of our literal biological father, but recognized that's, that's a way in which I conduct myself towards people. Uh, and that's what's being spoken of here, the way in which as a father with his children, Jesus deals with and ministers to and addresses those around him in that way. Um, you get a good example of that in um, Psalm 103, uh, verse 13. As a father pities or has compassion on his child, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. It's that, that fatherly care 
that fatherly compassion, that fatherly ability to enter into the pain, to understand the, the predicament, to understand the, the, the particulars of the situation, to, to feel it from the inside and to, to, to be prepared to do everything that is needed in order to alleviate that and to, to protect against the, the, the downside and the dangers of that and to help that child through those particular circumstances as a father pities, has compassion on his child, so the Lord has compassion on all who fear him. And how um, we are told about Jesus, as he looked out in the crowd, he had compassion on them. Um, it's, it's Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8 again. The Lord sees our misery. The Lord hears our groans. The Lord feels our pain, and the Lord comes to rescue us to take us out of that predicament and to bring us into a better place. That's who he is. That's what he's like. That's how he deals with us. He is as a father to his child. And Luke's gospel is, um, in point after point, it is the record of the way in which that compassion of Jesus is, is demonstrated so that all that he is as the very son of God and all that Adam was meant and made to be as the son of God to know that relationship, that dependence upon the father, Jesus is towards those he encounters. Remember how he is with Zacchaeus? Everyone else wants just to kind of uh, uh, scorn him and, and push him away, push him to the side, and Jesus has compassion on this man and, and, and sees and feels the, the, the misery of his existence, uh, an existence, a life that has been conditioned by wrong choices, wrong values, wrong perspectives, and now is, is just without any real satisfaction at all for him. And how does he get out of that predicament? How on earth does he extricate himself from this impossible situation? Jesus has compassion on him, looks up into the tree and says, Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus must have thought, how on earth do you know my name? And we haven't been introduced, and yet you, you know who I am. Of course he does. He, he knows everything about us because he, he has felt the pain of this man at a very human level. He has, he has listened to what people are saying, listened to what the crowd is saying, uh, and, and has put two and two together and sees this guy and is able to, to uh, recognize that's who he is and that's his predicament. And, and the compassion there, uh, I'm, I'm coming to your house. We'll, we'll eat together. We'll have a meal together in that way. And uh, Psalm 103, obviously, um, expands on the, uh, the notion of Jesus having compassion on us as a father by, by speaking in terms of the, the completeness of that forgiveness, whereby the past is simply removed from us uh, and no longer touches us. Uh, he removes our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. And when you, you stop and think about it, you go east, that way, um, you just keep going east, and, and you'll keep going east and east and east, and when you get to the east, you'll still be able to go east. You, you just keep going in that direction, and the west, well, you just keep going that way, and keep going that way. It is just an infinite gulf that is put between you and your sins. They are removed from you, and that gives you a new start that affords you healing, that affords you new possibilities. I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to give you hope and a future. And, uh, and, and that's, as the everlasting father, that's, that's what he always is. It's not when you get him on a good day, that's just who he is always, the everlasting father. Um, and I would argue that John's gospel, which rounds it off, um, well expresses this final designation of Jesus as the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom, that, that wholeness that is God's desire for us. John himself, in a sense, spells that out for us because we're not left in any doubt as to why John wrote his, his gospel record. He said, there's, there's a load of stuff that I could have packaged. In fact, there's so much that, uh, that there wouldn't be a library in the world that's able to hold all the books that could be written about this Jesus. But the things that I've written, he said, I have written them so that you might believe in Jesus as the Christ, as the Son of God, that you might see him for who he is, and that by believing in him, by entrusting your life to him, by that relationship you come to enjoy with him, because he's the child that is born to you and he's the son that is given to you, by uh, believing in him, you may have that life 
that shalom, that, that wholeness, that health and healthiness that is life in all its fullness. That's why I've written these things. And, and therefore, as you run your way through the, the gospel of, of John, there's a sense in which that's what he's underlining. He is the prince of peace. Peace in the face of crises. Uh, John chapter 2, a, a very normal crisis, a wedding. That's a kind of big deal for uh, any family. A big deal, and if things go wrong there, if the arrangements don't work out, it's embarrassing. It is a crisis. And in the face of a crisis, whatever the crisis may be, he's the Prince of Peace. He just sorts it out and, and enables everyone just to uh, press on as though um, nothing had happened. Um, there's, there's a peace that he brings into what otherwise would be panic, stressed out individuals, and it bypasses them. He, he is the Prince of Peace. Face my crises. All the crises that come your way, learn to recognize that's who he is. He, he sorts out these crises. You don't need to panic because he's the Prince of Peace and he brings that peace to you. Peace in the face of our longing. Sometimes we, we, we have this in our hearts, um, longings and yearnings and desires and they give us no, no peace at all. It's just that constant something that is missing in our lives. And, and that was the woman in John chapter four and, and he brings peace to her in her experience, in the face of those, those longings, the turmoil of her emotions, the torture in her heart, given her peace in that way. Peace in the face of hunger, uh, the, the feeding of the multitude, John chapter uh, 6. Um, a, a, another situation where, um, where, where am I going to get the food? Where am I going to get the, the wherewithal that I need in order to be able to go on? Where am I going to get the, the resources that I need, whether they're, they're physical resources, the food, or whether it's financial resource, whatever it may be, the emotional, where am I going to get those resources? Peace, says Jesus. You know, I can handle that. Uh, not a problem. And the Prince of Peace feeds the hunger that is there. Peace in the face of failure and shame. Remember the, the woman caught in adultery and about to be stoned to death and Jesus steps in and she knows the, the failure, she knows the shame and um, I, I don't know where the guy was because you can't really commit adultery with just one person but uh, he seemed to have kind of gone off somewhere or they, they weren't bothered about him but, but she feels really, really alone, really, really exposed how unfair in some ways is this, that, that she is the one that gets targeted in this manner. And, and yet there is that shame, there is that failure on her part. And Jesus steps in and who's going to stone you? Let him who's without sin cast the first stone. And, and peace breed into what otherwise was going to be just a, a storm of huge proportions for her. Peace in the face of sorrow. John chapter 11, and the, uh, the, the tomb of Lazarus, and the, the grief that is there, and the, the turmoil of emotions in the face of that grief, and, and peace as he handles that. He is the prince of peace. And the, the rest of the New Testament, in a sense, picks up on this. Uh, so that when Peter speaks to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, the, the Roman centurion, remember the Romans, they, they kind of... Uh, uh, um, uh, figured that the, the, the Pax Romana was the big thing. Peace, the Roman peace. Rome brings peace. And when Jesus speaks to Cornelius, he, he very deliberately uses language this guy understands. He says, you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, the good news of peace through Jesus Christ as Lord. It's not Caesar who's going to bring the peace. Caesar's way of bringing peace is anything but peaceful, anything but pleasant. He doesn't bring peace. Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is Lord. And that's the good news. God has given us a son who is Lord, and he brings that peace. And, um, and that's how Paul picks up on. Uh, he's the one who brings that peace, breathes that peace, gives that peace. My peace I give to you says Jesus, John's gospel, chapter 14. Um, and 
there's a, there's a sense in which I think the, the whole Bible rounds off with precisely this notion from John again in the book of Revelation. John chapter 21, and you get this, this wonderful picture of, uh, of peace at last as God's purposes in and through Jesus are brought to their true fulfillment and consummation. And at last, the dwelling of God is with men as the, the holy city, the, the, the city comes down, the bride of God, and at last, for the first time, the bride of Christ is now spoken of as the wife of the Lamb. That marriage, that consummation of all that has been in prospect, all that has been promised, all that, that has been the aspiration, the, the, the thing that we have looked forward to, that, that union with the living God, that communion, that, ref, that fellowship with him, that, that enjoyment of his near present, that enjoyment, that capacity to enjoy the living God to the full now reaches its consummation. And that city is then is described um, in in terms of, of a square, um, the four names, the four gospels, and then the four sides of the city, all of which are in perfect matchless balance. And it's not just a square, it's a cube. It's, it's kind of the full three-dimensional thing, um, indicative of, of the way in which at last things have been brought into their good, perfect order. It is huge, you do the measurements, it's massive. As wide as it is long and as high as it is long and wide. Just the perfect, massive cube. Everything in its right place at last. All our relationships, all the universe, all of humanity, all of heaven, all of eternity, everything in its right place. A new heaven, a new earth where Everything is right. Righteousness dwells. And that's what he does. He just puts things together again in a way that means they, they fit the way they're meant to fit. Life begins to work. He is the prince of peace. Um, that's who he is. And, uh, and that's why we rejoice in him. Uh, whatever may be happening around us, whatever may be gloomy, whatever may be leading to, to despair and distress, whatever may seem to be great clouds of darkness, this remains true. This child is born to you. This son is given to you. And who is he? Well, he is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. And he is the prince of peace. And you understand what, what that means with that thing? You've got to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've got to read the whole Bible. And you've got to spend all eternity simply enjoying and reveling in the sheer glory of this Jesus who is risen from the dead, alive and, uh, and on the throne today, and someone that you and I may know in our day-by-day -day lives. He makes the whole world of difference. And therefore, with him, you, you can anticipate growth. And part of, the, part of the problem that there has been in our land in the church of Jesus Christ in so many quarters, we've lost sight of who he is. We have belittled him and belittled who he is and what he's able to do and what he's pleased to do to such an extent that we, we, we simply cannot begin to imagine what could be done. The Bible says, look at him. Just open your eyes and see him for who he is. He is the mighty God. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the lasting father and the prince of peace. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read them the whole thing together. The whole caboodle there and get a handle on who this Jesus is. He is altogether great. And you want to come under his lordship. You want to come into that realm where he is king. You want to crown him as Lord of your life and live your life on that basis. Not, not kind of believing these things in your head and then kind of uh, one week to another just coming back on a Sunday and, and rehearsing them, but living every single moment of every single day through the week on that basis. You have him. He's been given to you to live your life with him, through him, in him, and for him. And he's wonderful. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of of peace. May God bless his word to our hearts. Father, thank you. Um, thank you for everything, every angle that you, you uh, bid us view your son from, 
every perspective that you give to us on him that we might get it into our slow heads. Just what a wonderful, glorious Savior he is. And we pray, please, Father, would, would you just by your Holy Spirit drive this truth into our hearts that this child is born to us. This son is given to us, the very son of God, given to us that we might know him in our every circumstance, day by day, and live our lives on the basis of that relationship with him. Would you help us, Father, even in our, our worship tonight as we round it off, simply to, to place our lives again under him, under his lordship, under his kingship, to crown him all over again as our king, and to be saying, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm yours. Do with me as you will. You're wise, you're strong, you're kind, and you're wonderfully good. Do this, Father, please, for your own glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's indeed use our closing praise to uh, give expression to that response to our God in Jesus. Crown him with many crowns.
moments as we close, commend one another to God and to his grace by saying together uh, yourselves as you join us online as well, the words of the grace. There's a prayer. Let's pray for one another. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.